you probably heard that cholesterol is very bad for your health because it's related to the onset of cardiovascular disease. But is this true? Is cholesterol really that bad for you? That's what I'm going to talk about now. Nearly all the evidence that links blood cholesterol levels to, cardio to cardiovascular disease is based on outdated and older research from 50 years ago or more. Contrary to popular belief, cholesterol is not a fat, but it's a form of alcohol. It's an alcohol compound. You cannot burn or oxidize cholesterol like you can with fat. The body will only rid itself of excess cholesterol through the reverse transport HDL system, which I'll explain a little bit later in this video. But the it's essential point here is that you cannot burn uh, uh, cholesterol like you can fat. There's only one real way to get rid of it, which is through the HDL reverse transport system. Uh, this basically causes cholesterol to be used as a, a raw material for the production of bile, which is uh, made in the liver, stored in the gallbladder, and used to help uh, emulsify fats to reduce the surface area of, of fat so that lipase, fat digesting enzymes, can digest the fat. That's a whole different story. Cholesterol is essential to health as it is a it's a core component of cellular membranes. <laughs> Without cholesterol, your your cell your cell would basically fall apart because the cholesterol is, is kind of like a, it's like taking the bricks out, out of a, out of a building. I mean, the building would fall down. Cholesterol is a, is a is a support system for cellular membranes. The cellular membranes have other things in there, including various types of fat. But cholesterol is the supporting material for cellular membranes. In the brain, very low cholesterol associated with brain degeneration over time, likely re related to this, the degeneration of cell membranes through having too little cholesterol. On the other hand, too much cholesterol in the brain is also associated with the onset of brain degeneration, including Alzheimer's disease. So cholesterol in the brain has to be tightly controlled. In fact, uh, there's a protein called apolipoprotein A, uh, apoprotein lipoprotein, apolipoprotein A4, it's called, and uh, this uh, is involved in, chole in the cholesterol metabolism and transport. Uh, when you uh, have two genes for apolipoprotein A4, your chances of acquiring uh, heart, uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, go up considerably, significantly. Uh, it doesn't mean you're going to definitely get Alzheimer's, but it's related to it. This shows the close relationship between cholesterol in the brain and Alzheimer's disease. Cholesterol is the uh, you should also know cholesterol is the raw material for steroid hormones, including testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, DHA, and cortisol. Cortisol is a steroid hormone. Uh, in the skin, cholesterol is converted into vitamin D after exposure to a certain spectrum of ultraviolet light from the sun. The ultra the uh, ultraviolet light has to be in a certain spectrum. In other words, the sun has to be at a right at a certain angle in the sky. To admit the, the correct spectrum, spectrum of ultraviolet light, uh, light which will uh, basically turn on the mechanism in the skin, which converts uh, cholesterol found in the skin into vitamin D. Uh, you could pr actually produce as much as 10 to 20,000 units of D uh, from exposure to ultraviolet light in only 15 to 20 minutes. So theoretically, if you expose most of your upper body uh, you could walk around naked too, but I think you you know yeah, that might get you in trouble with the law in certain places. But anyway, if you uh, if you most of your upper body is exposed to the right spectrum of ultraviolet light, uh, you would have your full complement of vitamin D. You wouldn't have to worry about taking D supplements or take or getting D from food. But uh, very few people actually do that, so most people are deficient in D. Even if now remember, even if you consume no cholesterol at all in food. Your liver would still produce about a gram or a thousand milligrams a day of cholesterol for the simple reason that cholesterol is essential to life. It's essential to health. I mean, to call cholesterol bad is so stupid, it's beyond belief. Now, you have different forms of cholesterol carriers. These are, are, uh, are substances uh, made in the liver that transport cholesterol in the blood and throughout the body. Uh, Low-density lipoprotein, also called LDL, is the primary carrier of cholesterol in the blood. Although LDL is often referred to as the bad cholesterol, in truth, it's only dangerous when oxidized. Among other functions, LDL delivers cholesterol to the testes, 
when the cholesterol is used as a raw material for the synthesis of testosterone. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go into the steps that where whereby cholesterol is converted into testosterone. However, it is a series of enzymatic step uh, steps which is initiated by the release of luteinizing hormone from the anterior pituitary gland. Uh, if you want more information about this, I talk about this a lot in my Applied Metabolics newsletter. I'm not going to get into it here. Otherwise, the video would be three hours long. And people already complain about my 20-minute videos. Some studies show that higher levels of H uh, LDL are associated with higher levels of testosterone. So before you panic because your LD, uh, LDL level is a little bit high, and by the way, in case you're wondering, uh, having an LDL level of 100 or less is considered normal. Uh, some doctors will say the lower the LDL, the better, but not so much if you're interested in testosterone because higher LDL levels, over 100, not too high, are associated with higher levels of testosterone. So if you have a, a level of uh, 50, where, where the LDL, you know, your uh, blood labs show a uh, LDL of 50, the odds are you're probably also low in testosterone too, because L like I say, LDL carries the cholesterol to the testes, where the cholesterol is converted in the Leydig cells into testosterone through a series of enzymatic steps, indoctrinated by, uh, or, or let's say started by the release of luteinizing hormone. The type of LDL that predominates in the blood also makes a difference. It's not just LDL, it's the size of the LDL. Smaller, dense forms of LDL are the most likely to be oxidized. And remember, only oxidized LDL is dangerous. LDL that's not oxidized is actually good for you. Only when it gets oxidized is it dangerous because it leads to the development of, of, of um, turns uh, macrophages, which are former white blood cells, they become foam cells, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to go into it, but you, you get atherosclerosis. Oxidized LDL is thought to be one of the initiators of atherosclerosis, which is a narrowing of the arteries, which is associated with heart attacks and strokes. Again, not going to get into that. All you need to know is that the small, dense forms of LDL are the most likely to be oxidized. Those are the truly dangerous uh, LDL. Uh, on the other hand, there's another kind of HDL, uh, LDL, large or fluffy. They're fluffy. They look like little sponges. This is this type of uh, fluffy LDL or large LDL is much less much light, less likely to be oxidized, and therefore presents a much lower risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, when you go on a high-fat diet, a lot of people don't realize you tend to favor the large fluffy LDL. So. You know, a lot of doctors criticize, let's say, low-carb, high-fat diets because, well, your LDL level goes up, so you're going to get heart disease. What they don't tell you is that the LDL that goes up is the large, fluffy type, which is not associated with heart disease because it has much less tendency to oxidize. That's the part to leave out. And guess what happens when you go, when you go on a low-fat, high-carb diet? You get the small, dense LDL, the type that is associated with cardiovascular disease. So the weird, ironic part is this: is the diet that a lot of doctors recommend to prevent heart disease, meaning a low-fat, high-carb diet, actually is is more risky for heart disease than a low-carb, high-fat diet, because the the high the uh, the high low the low the low-fat, high-carb diet favors small, dense LDL, which is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. What produces the smaller, dense forms of LDL? Or having higher blood triglyceride levels. Triglyceride is fat in the blood. And because triglyceride acts as a, a precursor for the production of smaller, dense LDL. Now, you say, well, what am I going to do about my uh, blood, blood triglycerides? Well, when you work out, you'll, you'll lower your, your blood triglycerides. Weight training, aerobics, lowers triglycerides. You're, if you're in a hurry to lower them even faster, ingest a fish oil supplement or eat fatty fish. Fish oil supplements or omega-3 fatty acids will lower blood triglycerides by as much as 65%. You don't have to take any drugs. And by doing that, you're going to lower your LDL, your small, dense LDL, which is uh, the oxidized dangerous form. What's also important is the number of small, dense LDL, known as LDLP, or the particles. P stands for particles. Having more of these particles raises the risk of, of cardiovascular disease events, such as heart attacks. The protective carrier of cholesterol in the blood is high-density lipoprotein, or HDL. HDL consists mainly of protein, and it works in the blood to pick up and remove excess cholesterol. Then it transports it back to the liver, where the cholesterol, as I said earlier, is converted into bile, 
and then excrete it. Higher HDL levels are considered protective against the onset of cardiovascular disease. Ingesting oral anabolic steroids promotes the activity of a liver enzyme that functions to degrade HDL, which lowers blood levels of HDL. Now, theoretically, that would mean that bodybuilders who use oral anabolic steroids are at a much greater risk of heart disease. And they are. If they use large amounts of oral anabolic steroids, they are without question at greater risk, but not so much because of the uh, HDL effect. That's only part of it. The other part has to do with structural changes in the heart induced by the steroids. Again, not uh, way too, not, not, it's not re relevant to this video, so I'm not going to get into that. Uh, but but you have to, what you have to understand is that the, 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 the breakdown of HDL induced by steroids is only important when coupled with a higher total cholesterol level and also higher LDL particle levels of small dense LDL. I know this sounds a little complicated, but what it means is, well, let me put it to you simple so you, you understand what I'm saying. A lot of bodybuilders have come to me to look at their blood tests. When they're on the oral steroids, they always show uh, high, very, very low HDL. But I also notice two other things when I look at the blood test. Their LDL level is also well below 100, which means that uh, there's no cholesterol being laid down. And furthermore, most of the guys, because of their diets and their training and the fact that they have very low body fat levels, they have uh, blood cholesterol levels that are well below 150. Nathan Pritikin, who was famous for his low-fat diet many years ago, used to often state that if your total blood cholesterol was 150 or less, you were not laying down plaque in your in your coronary arteries. So even though the bodybuilders on oral steroids have very low HDL levels, the fact that they have total cholesterol, which is very low, and, and their HDL, uh, HDL and HDL particles are also very low, they're at much less risk of, of heart disease than would seemingly be true. However, again, more recent studies show that taking oral anabolic steroids does adversely affect cardiac structure. In other words, it affects uh, the structure of the heart in such a way that, you know, continued use of oral anabolic, ster anabolic steroids over many years does set you up when you get older for congestive heart failure. Uh, the way to prevent that is the continued exercise you know, eat nutritious foods, don't eat junk food, and keep your body fat levels down. If you do, you'll be okay. The misconception about cholesterol is that consuming foods rich in cholesterol will raise blood cholesterol levels. How many times have you heard a uh, doctor say, don't eat this, it's high in cholesterol like eggs. Well, eggs are bad, you know, egg yolks are they're loaded with cholesterol. You know, you eat them, you're going to have a heart disease. Yeah, bullshit is what I say. Uh, cholesterol, <laughs> this was the assumption years ago that led to cholesterol being banned, uh, a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. In fact, the body tightly controls the absorption of cholesterol from food to the extent that most of the ingested food cholesterol is excreted without being absorbed. The usual figure is that the average person who doesn't have any genetic problems absorbs less than 10% of the cholesterol found in food. So no matter how high the food is in cholesterol content, you're only going to absorb at the most 10%, and, and in most cases, as low as 1%. When you, su when you consume cholesterol in food, less cholesterol is produced in the liver. There's a kind of feedback system, and vice versa. The less cholesterol you consume, the more cholesterol is produced in the liver. For example, vegans who don't eat a lot of saturated fat and, uh, uh, you know, don't eat a lot of foods. Uh, animal Only animal foods contain cholesterol. Plant foods do not. So because vegans don't eat uh, animal foods, they don't get they get very little cholesterol in their diet. So as a consequence, their liver is producing cholesterol at full bore. They're producing a gram a day. And again, they have to because cholesterol is essential to life. So it makes no difference. Even if you eat no cholesterol at all, your liver will always produce cholesterol because it's needed, as I said, for hormone production, cell membrane integrity, and so on and so forth. Now, the usual recommend, recommendation for cholesterol in, uh, intake by health authorities, most of which are, most of them are full of crap, but that's another story. The usual recommendation is not to consume more than 300 milligrams of cholesterol a day. That's about the amount found in one egg yolk. Yet eating whole eggs does not raise blood cholesterol levels except in rare genetic conditions that allow greater uptake of cholesterol from food. As I said, anywhere from 20 to 40 percent of people have this little genetic quirk. Usually it's the lower figure, about 28 percent of people. They have a genetic quirk where they absorb a little more cholesterol than normal. 
that for those people eating like 12 or 24 eggs a day probably would affect blood cholesterol levels, which again is not really relevant anyway. But that's again another story. There was one guy documented in a medical journal, I remember reading, this was an older guy, about 60 years old, who was consuming 25 whole eggs a day for years, like over 10 years. He had no changes at all in his blood cholesterol level. None. No changes at all. The doctors were befuddled. They thought this guy would have all kinds of heart disease. Nothing. He had no cardiac risk factors. Nothing. Okay, that's only one case. They call that in science a case study. It's not considered solid information, but it gives you an idea. I think most people are like this guy where eating eggs is going to have very little effect on their total blood cholesterol level. But as I said, tw about 25% of people consuming foods that can contain chole uh, cholesterol will raise LDL levels. But but, but here's the thing. When, when, when you eat the eggs, let's say, that have the cholesterol, it'll raise LDL. But, you know, the fat in the eggs all also raises HDL levels which counterbalances the rise of LDL, so it neutralizes it. You get no effect, nothing. Even, even in those in whom consuming cholesterol does raise their LDL levels, these people do not show greater rates of cardiovascular disease because the type of LDL that increases is the safer, large, fluffy form that doesn't, isn't prone to oxidation. See, you see how you have to read through, read between the lines for all this crap that these people hand you? That's why you, you have to listen to my videos, because I'm going to tell you the truth. <laughs> anyway, reports from the Lipid Research Clinic Research Prevalence Study and the Framingham Heart Study, which has been going on for about 60 years in Framingham, Massachusetts, have shown that dietary cholesterol is not related to either blood cholesterol or heart disease deaths. In a similar manner, 10 clinical trials conducted between 1994 and 1996 of the effects of dietary cholesterol on blood lipids and lipoproteins indicate that addition of an egg or two a day to a low-fat diet has little, if any, effect on blood cholesterol levels, just like I said. This observation was noted in young men and women with normal cholesterol levels, as well as older subjects who had elevated plasma cholesterol levels. When foods rich in... But now, there is something to consider, though. There is one caveat to all this. When you when you cook foods uh, that contain cholesterol under high heat conditions, some of the fat uh, that's found in the food is oxidized, and, and uh, so is the cholesterol. It becomes what they call oxysterols. Uh, oxysterols could possibly be related. They are toxic forms of fat, and again, they only occur when when fat is heated at high temperature. Oxysterols could be related to the development of cardiovascular disease. But right now, there is, isn't a ton of evidence to show this. It is a theory, but there's not a lot of uh, evidence to show this. However, <coughs> on the safe side, I would be careful and uh, I'd be prudent uh, and be careful about overcooking foods that can, like, for instance, eggs or something like that, that do contain pretty good amounts of cholesterol because a lot of it, of the fat will be turned into oxysterols, which could have some bad effects. We don't know, but why take a chance? You know, don't overcook your uh, foods that contain cholesterol. Now, what do you want to do? What do you do if you, you have high cholesterol levels, you want to lower it? Well, the first choice of doctors, if you have high, if you go have a blood test and they show a high total cholesterol or a to high, a high uh, LDL level, immediately the doctor is going to take out his little pad and write you a prescription for statin drugs. Statin drugs are, are among the biggest uh, prescribed, the, the most, the greatest prescribed drugs in the world. And what they do is they uh, supposedly lower cholesterol, and uh, they might have an effect on LDL cholesterol. But recent studies show that that's not really the way statins work. That's not why they help prevent heart disease. If they do, because there's some studies that say that statins are, aren't even effective. And like any other drug, statins have side effects. They can adversely affect the liver, and they can adversely affect eye function. So you want to try and avoid statin drugs if you can. Uh, and also, by the way, statin drugs, uh, pr they break down muscle tissue excessively when you work out. If you're on statin drugs, they will break down your muscle tissue excessively. It's going it's to really put a monkey wrench in any muscle and strength gains. Now, now, the reason it does that is because statin drugs uh, interfere with a, a, what they call the mevalinate pathway, pathway in the liver, which produces coenzyme Q Q10 from precursors like L-tyrosine, the amino acid. So 
what this means, although some doctors would argue about this, what this means is if you do, if you do have to take statin drugs, you'd be well advised to also take your Coenzyme Q10 supplement. Uh, take at least 100 milligrams a day. Make sure you take it with a, a lot of fat, like egg yolks, because Coenzyme Q10 is fat-soluble, very, very hard to absorb. Uh, there are forms of Coenzyme Q10 which are made more soluble. I use one of, of myself. I use a form of Coenzyme Q10 that's soluble in water and fat, uh, you know, because again, Coenzyme Q10 is probably one of the hardest nutrients to absorb. You know, you got to have a lot of fat normally to absorb it. So what, what else do you do? Let's say you don't want to take statin drugs. What should you do to lower your cholesterol? Here's what you do. First thing you want to do is increase your intake of soluble fiber. There's two kinds of fiber, insoluble and soluble. Insoluble fiber is found in vegetables and stuff like bran, the unprocessed bran. Soluble fiber, soluble fiber is found in fruits, vegetables, oats contain soluble fiber. What does soluble fiber do? Locks onto the fat, locks onto the cholesterol, literally pulls it out of the body. So it has a, it actually will lower your cholesterol by causing interfering with the uh, the uptake and and it's speeding the excretion of both saturated fat and cholesterol. Uh, if your cholesterol is really already very bad, like let's say over 300, you might want to consider taking the B-complex vitamin niacin. Niacin is uh, very, very effective at lowering uh, blood fats. It'll also raise HDL a bit. Uh, but uh, don't, take with a, don't take the time-release forms of niacin because the time-release forms of niacin are very hard on the liver. Only take the regular form. Start out with about, now when you take niacin, you're going to get this flush feeling caused by a dilation of the uh, blood vessels under the skin and the release of histamine. Could be very uncomfortable for some people. So you want to start off with a low dose, maybe 500 milligrams of niacin, and gradually build up till you get until you get up to about two grams a day. When you're up to two grams, I think you're going to see a pretty big drop in cholesterol levels if you can handle it. Uh, if the flush really bothers you, take an aspirin about about 30 minutes before you take the niacin. It'll prevent the flush effect. If you forget to take the aspirin and you get a flush effect, drink drink a 12 ounce glass of water. The flush effect will be gone in about five to six minutes. Now, another thing that just if you lower body fat, if you go on a diet, lower body fat, you don't have to do anything. Your cholesterol is going to go down. Your HDL is going to go down automatically. You don't have to change. You, know, you well, of course, you have to change your diet to lose body fat, but you don't have to do anything special. Just lose body fat, your cholesterol goes down. Exercise, of course, both weight training and aerobics raises HDL cholesterol and thus helps to prevent. Uh, Cardiovascular disease, it also helps to modify lower and lower blood pressure. So exercise definitely is absolutely essential to preventing cardiovascular disease. Now, there's another controversy. Some scientists often suggest substituting polyunsaturated fat instead of saturated fat. Now, polyunsaturated fat is fat at liquid that's liquid at room temperature, such as various kinds of vegetable oil, safflower oil. These are called omega-6 fats. But the problem with uh, substituting uh, omega-6 fat uh, or polyunsaturated fat instead of saturated fat is that an excess of omega-6 uh, uh, fatty acids is associated in some cases with uh, increased uh, systemic inflammation, which itself is actually the, one of the main causes of uh, cardiovascular disease. In fact, statins work not so much by lowering cholesterol, but they work by lowering inflammation. That's why they help prevent heart disease. It's inflammation because heart disease has an underlying uh, base, uh, underlying cause, if you want to call it, of inflammation. It's the inflammation that's uh, uh, the systemic inflammation and in the, and in the blood vessels. So that's the cause of actual cardiovascular disease, not cholesterol. It's inflammation. And by the way, eating a lot of processed sugar uh, is, uh, or stuff like processed sugar, fructose, high syrup fructose, that's much more dangerous for you in relation to causing cardiovascular disease than eating any amount of saturated fat. Again, they don't tell you that, though. You know, however, an excess of, like I said, an excess of omega-6 is, uh, you know, it's like the devil of deep blue sea. You know, the uh, polyunsaturated fats might lower your blood cholesterol. In the meantime, they're increasing your chance of cancer. The two leading causes of death are, are in order. Number one, heart disease. Number two, cancer. So now you, by, you increase the, it's, it's, it's pathetic. You increase the polyunsaturated fat, you lower the risk of heart disease, but you increase the risk of cancer. Not good. Not good. I think a better idea, if you ask me, is to lower saturated in fat, fat intake by substituting by consuming lean meat that's lower, all, everything, just lower your saturated fat intake. 
and and and, and other sources of uh, saturated fat, but substitute an in increased intake of monounsaturated fat, such as found in uh, macadamia nuts or extra virgin olive oil. In fact, one study found that substituting monounsaturated fatty uh, fat as found in olive oil instead of saturated fat lowered the risk of cardiovascular disease by over 80 percent. That's all they did. All they did is is exchange saturated fat for the monounsaturated fat, the olive oil. The risk of heart disease went down 80 percent. No statin drug in the world can even come close to that. Statin drugs maybe 20% lower the chance of uh, cardiac. This is 80% merely by substituting monounsaturated fat for saturated fat. Only two types of diet, but remember this, only two types of fat are known to maintain test testosterone levels in the body. One is saturated fat, the other is monounsaturated fat. If you eliminate both, your, te your, te your uh, production of testosterone is going to go down to nothing. And forget about making muscle and strength gains if that happens. Uh, finally, the final final thing to consider. A low carbohydrate diet makes saturated fat irrelevant. How could that be? Most like most low most low carbohydrate diets, especially ketogenic diets, which feature twenty uh, an intake of twenty grams of carbohydrate a day or less, but the ketogenic diets could have as much as sixty five, even seventy percent fat. A lot of it's dietary fat. Why aren't all these people on ketogenic diets dropping dead of heart attacks? What's going on? How come they're not dying? Very simple. Because when you when you lower your carb intake, guess what the body uses as fuel? Saturated fat. It burns it up. Doesn't give it a chance to create LDL cholesterol. It's gone. It's oxidized. And also, while low carb diets may raise levels of H, uh, of LDL because of the fat intake. The diet will also lower blood triglycerides, which, as I said earlier, is the precursor for, for the small, dense LDL, which is very dangerous when oxidized. And also, because of the high-fat uh, feature of, of low-carb diets, it'll raise your HDL, which, again, counterbalances the increase in LDL. So there you go. So, you know, like I say, I, uh, the uh, low-carb diet is actually, contrary to what a lot of these moron scientists will say, who will tell you, oh, it's going to low carb diet, it's going to cause you to drop dead of heart attack. Bullshit. I don't know, you know, a lot of these guys are, I don't know what their ties they have to food industry. I don't know why they say that nonsense. It's simply not true. Low carb diets are actually considered beneficial in prevention of cardiovascular disease. So that's about it. I hope I clarified up the mysteries uh, related to cholesterol. And again, I just want to add one caveat. If you're one of those people that are, you know, genetically, predisposed to absorbing more cholesterol, you know, then you're going to, you know, you could find this out in certain tests. Those people cannot wantonly eat like three dozen eggs a day. Those people have to be a little more careful. And again, be careful of overcooking foods uh, that contain cholesterol because of the oxysterol effect. If you want the most in-depth information on nutrition, exercise science, food supplements that work, which don't, uh, fat loss techniques that work, really work, and the ones, uh, you know, the fat loss things that really work, uh, exercise science, hormonal therapy, anti-aging research that you can use today, women's health and fitness, ergogenic aids, all of this and more is included every month in my Applied Metabolics newsletter. That's www.appliedmetabolics.com. 40 to 50 pages every month, no advertisements, and includes my 58 years of constant study and empirical uh, experience, which is uh, redundant. In other words, what I mean by empirical, those are the years I've spent in the gym. I'm not one of these armchair philosophers who writes about nutrition. Uh, in fact, Arnold Schwarzenegger just said that to, about me the other day. He said, Jerry's unique because not only does he write about this stuff, but he's actually in the gym and in, in, the, in the field himself. He, he, he's, he's there, you know, he, he's there in the, in the practical sense. I'm not some ivory tower academic who's never set foot in the gym and tries to advise people that are in the gym on how to eat and how to work out. I'm there in the trenches right there with you. So I know what works and what doesn't work. And I'm telling you the truth. There's no BS in my Applied Metabolics newsletter. It's all evidence-based, and it does include much of my practical experience, which is priceless. There's nobody on this in the entire Internet that has a digital publication that can match my years of experience and study. I don't care if they have 40 PhDs. They're never going to match what I know. I guarantee it, and I'm including all this in my Applied Metabolics newsletter. So subscribe today, uh, www.appliedmetabolics.com. When you subscribe, I will send you an invitation to join my private Applied Metabolics Facebook page, where every month 
I post, uh, I'm sorry, every day I post new, uh, new information on nutrition, exercise, science, medicine, and general health. Uh, I have an uh, uh, email portal on my Applied Metabolic site only for current subscribers. They can send me short questions. I'll be happy to answer if you're a current subscriber. I, I do not accept unsolicited questions. You're welcome to, uh, to uh, uh, leave comments. Uh, and suggestions for future videos under this uh, yeah, uh, under this video. <coughs> I, I don't guarantee that I'll answer the questions. Uh, it depends on how much time I have. Uh, and uh, also, I just uh, I noticed a comment the other day. Somebody criticized me because uh, occasionally I mispronounce some of these technical terms, you know. And they said that I lose credibility because of that. Now, anybody with even a, a brain the size of a pea will understand that it's more important that the information that I'm relaying in these videos is true and evidence-based and real rather than how I pronounce, mispronounce or mispronounce anything. I mean, what's the point of pronouncing everything correctly and then telling you a bunch of crap that isn't true? I ask you, what would you rather have? A, a, a couple of mispronunciations uh, where, where, where the rest of it's garbage? or maybe a, uh, mispronunciations, but solid evidence-based truth. That was my little rant. I'm going to leave it at that. It was a very stupid comment, I thought, extremely stupid. You know, but anyway, if you want to have the best friend you'll ever have, you'll go to your local shelter, adopt a dog. They're the best, and my dog never mispronounces anything. He calls it like it is. Take care.